Thanks, Danielle. And I'm going to apologize now. I'm going to try to move fast because we are pretty significantly behind. It is my privilege today to talk about appendicitis and how managing this in the pediatric patient smaller can actually be harder. All right. So I have nothing to disclose financially. I am going to talk about off-label use for Ketorolac and Expiril, mainly because they're not approved in children and we use them pretty standardly. Um, the objectives that we're going to cover are the two on the screen that are in your uh, program. So why is smaller harder? In the less than two-year-old child, it's almost impossible to take a history to, to find out early. It does happen in neonates and infants. It's rare. That's not going to be the focus of this talk. Older than six years old, they're going to behave more like an adult, and multiple studies have shown there's no real advantage to taking the straightforward adult-type appendicitis to a pediatric center. Um, so that is also not going to be the focus of the talk. But looking at the two- to six-year-old range, those smaller patients can be a little bit more of a challenge. So that's where we will focus. Even the diagnosis can be difficult to make in this age group. We're still going to use the same four parameters, but we may approach them a little differently. The classic symptoms that you would see in an older patient, the two and three and four-year-old are probably not going to be able to communicate that to you. So a strategy to ask questions such as, when was the last time you or your child was completely normal or well? What was it you noticed that made you realize something was wrong? What have you done to treat it? What else is going on with it? Anyone else sick at home? And during this pandemic, we do need to do a COVID screen because there is MISC, which we'll touch on towards the end, that can be confused with appendicitis. So on exam, when the younger kids um, distraction, make friends, get down on their level, while you're doing this, you get a lot from observation. Do they look sick or not sick? Are they still or are they wiggling around? I ask the little kids to show me with one finger where the pain is. If they can point to one spot, they probably have peritoneal irritation, and it's a very good sign that they have appendicitis. If they take their finger and swirl it around and point to their whole belly, most likely they don't have peritonitis and don't have appendicitis. Percussion for peritonitis away from the right lower quadrant is a really good test for peritonitis in the children, and you don't damage the ability to check it again. Um, for the child you don't think has peritonitis, having them jump, and if they'll jump repeatedly, they very likely do not have peritonitis. So in the laboratory, CBC, CRP, uh, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, we're going to check these, but none of them um, really are highly sensitive or specific and may be normal. So we're going to bundle that with our history physical and then consider imaging. So ultrasound would really be the gold standard. This is um, non-radiating uh, diagnostic test with the caveat that if you are not at a pediatric hospital, you may not have the expertise in the ultrasound techs, and in a heavier, more obese patient, it may be more difficult. CT should probably be reserved for uh, patients that you think are perforated or may have a phlegmon or an abscess that might alter your management, or in that patient where it's just a diagnostic conundrum. And while MRI is reported and is not radiation, it does take longer to do. It's more expensive. And in the young child, you'll probably have to sedate them. So it's really not moving to the forefront for imaging. What probably is helpful is to look at the pediatric appendicitis score and the Alvarado score, either one of those, but not in isolation. But use it to stratify your risk. Um, do they have a low score, they're a low risk, that's a patient you can probably send home. The moderate risk is the group that's at risk for a negative appendectomy, and you might want to do some additional imaging or admit that patient and do serial exams. The one with the high score is probably going to go right to the OR without any additional imaging. So putting that into a clinical pathway and, and using that will improve your diagnostic ability and your outcomes. 
Surgery does remain the gold standard. Non-operative therapy for both uncomplicated and complicated appendicitis is appropriate, but is not going to be the focus of this talk either. So looking at surgery, what's the timing? Well, most patients are going to have an immediate laparoscopic appendectomy during the day or the evening. For uncomplicated appendicitis and for complicated appendicitis without a phlegmon or an abscess. You might consider non-operative therapy for the complicated appendicitis with a phlegmon or an abscess and come back in six to eight weeks after antibiotic therapy, plus or minus IR drainage if they had an abscess. Looking at the technique, basically the smaller the patient, the farther away from the target you need to put your ports. In the picture that's on the slide, some uh, f form of that setup will work for almost every size patient and every location of the appendix, from infrahepatic, retrocolic, retrocecal to the perforated appendix that's down in the pelvis. Single or three-port laparoscopic surgery, the long-term cosmesis is similar, so whichever you're comfortable with. We're going to generally use a 30-degree scope. You can make entry with a vertical incision through the umbilicus and spreading um, a, a natural umbilical defect, or in a heavier patient, a curvilinear umbilical incision. Fascial closure in the smaller patients is needed for the five millimeter port sites. Um, generally, I use two fives and a 12 because it accommodates all the off the shelf devices that you might want to use. Um, and then if you look at a patient and they have significant distension or inflammation, you may need to do a little general dissection with the scope in order to get your second and third ports in. Irrigate if you need to, put a drain if you need to, use local anesthetic. I use one-to-one -one Marcane and Exparel. Assess if an NG tube is absolutely necessary. We don't tend to use a lot of them. I use Toradol at the completion of the case to minimize narcotic use. The little ones, I manually empty the bladder prior to the incision. For the ones that are potty trained, I have them void before they go back and don't use a Foley. For post-op, non-complicated appendicitis, you're going to feed them and discharge them as soon as they take PO, walk to the bathroom, and their pain is controlled by mouth. For me, that's an outpatient operation. They don't need any additional antibiotics. They shouldn't need any narcotics. You're going to do a nurse call follow-up in one to two weeks. Just make sure you look at the pathology report. For complicated appendicitis, most of them can be started on a diet. They aren't going to take much anyway. Most don't need an NG tube. You're going to give IV antibiotics until they're clinically improved. And what does that mean? Taking good PO, they're pain controlled on PO meds, they're afebrile and labs. Whatever white blood cell count you have set in your clinical pathway as your threshold is what you might use to decide when you're ready to switch to oral antibiotics. The systematic review from APSA, if you've given less than five days IV, then you would want to give them PO to total seven days. Special situations, COVID-19, neonatal infant appendicitis, I already mentioned and really won't dwell on. But MISC um, is something that we are seeing a fair amount of. We saw it with the first wave of COVID, and those kids present like they might have appendicitis, but they are sicker and the treatment is not an appendectomy. Um, the patients this time around are having more respiratory symptoms, so we don't know what we're going to see with the MISC this time around. And then the other thing, I would, the last thing I would say is if your patient is COVID positive, there is no reason not to treat them the same way you would if they were COVID negative, unless they're having respiratory symptoms and then talk to the anesthesiologist. You're still going to go ahead and, and do a laparoscopic appendectomy. One of the New York City um, hospital experiences, they were able 91% of the time with their COVID positive patients to go ahead as if they were COVID negative. So in summary, smaller can be harder. Non-pediatric surgeons can certainly take care of pediatric appendicitis, but there are special situations in children less than six years of age that would benefit from the care of a pediatric surgeon. Thank you.